Dr. Kimberly, or should I say Dr. Burnout? So excited to see you again. I wish I could give you a big old hug. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Sandy. I'm excited to be here. Oh, it's so great. I met Dr. Kimberly or Dr. Burnout. I'm going to go back and forth um, in New York almost a year ago. We yes. met in New York at a conference. And uh, so I'm so excited. I couldn't, I couldn't wait for this conversation because you have so much to offer people. So before we get started on your burnout and how you help people with that part, what was your story? How did you get to this point? And, you know, what were some of the things that you learned along the way? Well, I think I'll kind of go uh, backwards a little bit. So the third time I burned out <laughs> was right at the beginning of the pandemic. Because as you can guess, people found mental health. <laughs> like if they didn't know it existed before, they found out that it existed during the pandemic because people wanted to connect. They wanted to to hear another person, to understand, to get close. And um, I was working 19 hour days, especially with the cruise ships and everything going on. And family life was just so chaotic and I was exhausted. And I started to implement different strategies to Basically, I was my own guinea pig because this was the third time that this was happening to me. And uh, I just couldn't go through this anymore. And initially, I was inspired to as well because my grandmother, she died at the age of 55. So part of my mission is to cure 5,500 women of burnout because of her. Um, she died at a very young age. I, you know, I'm 55 now. So... You know, just to think that I could not be here because I'm living living a life where I'm so busy giving, 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 and I'm not putting pouring back into myself. So I hope that mm. answered your question. In the wrong time. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you say you you felt burnt out, what were those symptoms? Just so for people that maybe aren't sure if they're experiencing burnout, like what what were you what were you going through? Right. Well, there was a lot of disillusionment, um, you know, and that's very common. It's like, oh, my goodness, there's so many people. There's no way that I can help everybody. They just keep coming. You know, so I just felt very ineffectual. I was beginning to feel depressed, having headaches, a really big sign for me that I'm going uh, uh, beginning that stress cycle into burnout is I begin to lose many things. So my concentration is off. It's like, where are my keys? Where are my glasses? Where where are a variety of things? I begin to lose those. Uh, I begin to feel irritable. So when I get irritable with my children, and when they ask small things or even people um, that I'm not even irritated with, I'm just agitated with the situation, That those are big signs. Sometimes headaches, stomach aches, especially headaches, they were a big trigger for me. Um, and just exhaustion. So, so many people try to, they confuse stress and burnout. Um, but when you begin, when it goes on for a prolonged period of time, as we know the pandemic, well, it's still kind of here. Uh, but after about four, four months of this, that's when I discovered, okay, I'm in, I'm in burnout. It's no longer stress. I'm in burnout. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, working... 19 hours a day will burn anybody out anyway. Right? right. So that, that I'm sure you maybe cut back on some of the hours that you're working. Absolutely. But yeah. Yeah. And like, I really didn't think that losing your concentration was a sign of like being burnt out. I mean, I just thought it was like getting older. <laughs> well, that too. And, and that's, it's so interesting how so many, symptoms are correlated with to other co-occurring disorders so it's really difficult to tease out you know what's the difference between depression and stress and burnout uh, but one of the main features of burnout is that it's a prolonged period of time mm -hmm. whereas stress tends to be very short-lived uh, say for example like we both mentioned that we have children going to college so getting them prepared for that process you know that's stress you know right. There's yeah. a beginning and there's an end, and maybe there's a little sadness that follows. But after, if you've had prolonged burnout, right, that fatigue, you begin, uh, that can delve into uh, depression. 
if you are careful. Mm, okay. If that's making okay. sense. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, so you said that you were your own little guinea pig. What types of things were you trying out? And, and was there, was there one or two things that you found that really did work that you can share with the audience and, and maybe things that you share with your clients? Oh, absolutely. So I, I created about nine, nine steps. It, it, they're all C's <laughs> for cure your burnout. Uh, but the very first step I'll, I'll cover and then I'll get into is consider. So I really had to do, it's like a diagnostic assessment, like what is not working? Where Where is the toxicity in my life? What is causing me the distress? And so whether it was relationships, whether, whether it's my thoughts about what our success and uh, <laughs> what I need to do or what I should do. So a lot of it was taking control of my mindset and how I defined a lot of things that were going on in my life, uh, which was really shocking when I began to dig and delve deep down into that. And um, one of the things when you talk about coping strategies, one of the things that I found that was very helpful is developing a comfort kit. Mm. And so uh, it's, it's essentially, it's, it can be whatever you want. It's a little bag and it has all of the things that deal with your senses. So something that smells good. So something olfactory. So uh, for me, that's a perfume. For others, it might be some essential oils. You put in a bag and you keep that close to you. And when you have something that smells good, that's olfactory, it stimulates those pleasure centers in the brain and brings about a certain amount of relief. Uh, oh. I have something visual. So whether that is, uh, you know, a picture of my child or someplace I want to visit is something that brings about pleasing emotions that I can have right there with me in the moment. Something that I can touch. Now, for me, I use bouting balls. I was going to get them. Have you ever seen those? I those think are them? those like the little balls you squeeze or like? Well, they're, they're oh. metal balls. And oh, you can okay. manipulate them in your hand and they have a little chime in them. So they're tactile as well as auditory. Oh, okay. And so th there's some place to direct that stress and that, that energy, that nervous energy that you have in you, as well as giving you an auditory st stimulation. Uh, so the, that brings the next thing, something that sound that sounds good for you. So for a lot of people, that's music. For, for me, that tends to be a meditation, a calm meditation. So auditory and kinesthetic. So I tend to take a stretchy band with me. So if it, either I'll just stretch out and, or I'll use that stretchy band. So doing all of those things can really help channel some of your stress. Mm, I love that. Now, in terms of um, you, were, you were talking about like diving into what it is that is toxic in your life. Mm -hmm. Is there like, like, should people write it out? Like, like, where do you start with that? Like, what's like, if they're like, okay, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'm feeling burnt out. I don't even know where to begin. Right. Well, one of, uh, one of the books I would recommend with that is definitely uh, The Body Keeps the Score. And I tend mm. to ask my clients, like, wh where are you feeling discomfort? In your body because that's that's a really good barometer that something is going on like i will tend to feel it sometimes in my chest and sometimes in my stomach and i'll ask like what what is that what is in my gut what is going wrong what when did i begin to feel that way and if you can begin to target that so sometimes a lot of time it's walking backwards from because that's what we tend to notice like oh my stomach is hurt why what just happened because it didn't just happen in an instant. There was something that occurred that made you feel that distress. So for some people, it's writing it down. For others, uh, they like to use their voice recorder. Um, and for some clients I have, they actually like to paint all out their feelings. So whatever it is that allows you to express yourself, do that. Mm, I love that. That's really great. It's really great. So, so you are by... You're a licensed marriage and family therapist. Yes. And you have, and you're, you're a PhD. Yes. Obviously. Yes. So what, do you still work with 
families and marriage, marriage, you know, couples, or like what has your, has your practice totally gone into burnout now? So I do continue to do some individual work and they tend to be my long, some long-term clients that, that come and go, uh, I'm not doing so much of the couples therapy uh, just because it, the, in this digital world, couples are spread out in so many locations and you have to actually be licensed in the state where everybody is at. So uh, I've just kind of let that go and, and I'm moving toward burnout. So. Okay. Fantastic. Fantastic. What is some of the best advice that you've received that you can share with the audience today? To help with burnout. Oh, okay. Specifically to help with burnout. Specifically okay. with burnout. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'd say specifically to help with burnout, that your situation, you can always change your situation. So a lot of people get trapped in their mind about what has to be. And everything is just a decision away. You can change the whole trajectory of your life by making one decision. And it can be made at any time. So I think that's that's the best burnout um, advice I have. So many people feel trapped in these jobs or these roles that they've gotten because they have to maintain the house and the car and the boat and the kids and the... You can find a different plan to make that choice. <laughs> Yes. I said that because I hear that so often. People are trapped in these jobs that they don't. I, I don't even want to say that they don't love. It's it's they don't even they don't like it. They hate it now. Yeah. Well, I don't you think a lot of that has to do with COVID and how so many people were affected. There was so much turmoil going on in the United States as a whole. Anyway, when it happened, because yeah. it was right after, like you know, or no there was a presidential election. I mean, there was just so much going on right around the time that COVID hit. And I think so many people just started reevaluating their life. And what am I doing? What is my purpose here? Right, right. You know? But there were so many issues that came up, so many divisions in families and questioning your values. I, I know I had a, a few few friends that I recategorized. <laughs> Once I discovered some some things that didn't necessarily align with my values, it doesn't diminish what we had before, but I didn't want to continue knowing what I knew now. Um, well, and that also, if you're in a burnout, right, and you've got people in your life that aren't supporting you, right, you do, I, and I love, I just have to acknowledge that, I love the recategorize your friendships. I love that because yeah. yeah, you're, you know, I mean, there are people, I know I've had people in my life that, that reached a point where they became like a vampire to me, you know? And when I say vampire, like they just drain the energy, yes. like they're sucking my blood and they drain the energy. And I love that. And now I'm going to use that. Like I've recategorized them. <laughs> they yeah. still have a place in my heart. It's just, you know, sometimes that's taking care of yourself and you have to do that to take care of yourself, especially if you're in a burnout. Right. 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 Yeah. Be because people will breach your boundaries and have you doing things. And that, that's something so common that I see with my client. It's not just that work is sucking their energy out of them. It's an energy vampire for them. It's they're, they're helping they're helping family, they're helping friends, they're doing this, they're volunteer. And no, nothing is wrong with, with any of that. It's quite admirable. But when it gets to the point that all of these systems are taking and not giving anything back, there's no return or regard for your needs and your well-being, and you can't even acknowledge that you have a need, that's problematic. Yeah, yeah. So how much is shifting your perception or your perspective part of getting out of a burnout? Oh, you know, I, I've never been asked that question, but I, if I, if I had to, since I'm on the spot now, I'd say at least 33, 33 and a third percent of that, right? Is, yeah. is your perspective and really beginning to shift it because it's undoing 
all of the, it's undoing sometimes many of the values and, and the foundation of your being, um, especially if that has to do with um, church or, or your right. work ethic, because what is it in American culture? We need to work hard. Not we need to work smart, <laughs> or we need to make sure our family, we need to work hard. And uh, sometimes we need to work smarter. Yeah. I, I once was in a church where our church service would begin at 9 a.m. We wouldn't get out until 2.30. The pastor would then want to speak with me for an hour. And I had young children. <laughs> that was not sustainable. And no. she wanted me to do volunteer work. Yeah, yeah, that's not sustainable. I mean, I think an hour in church with children is is hard to sustain. <laughs> yeah, because you can't keep those kiddos still that long. Yeah. No, they were little fat little monkeys because I just kept feeding them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, eat. Quiet, quiet. Oh wow, wow. Yeah. So, so yeah, I was just thinking about shifting your perspective because. And, and, and it also goes back to your stress because stress, yes, there's a start and an ending and getting out of a stressful situation a lot of times can be just shifting your perspective, but a burnout is a lot deeper than that. Yeah. Um, so I was just kind of curious about, you know, shifting that perspective and, and, and is that even a possibility? Because if you're in a deep, I don't know that I've ever really fully been burnout. I've hit rock bottom right. before. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that was kind of a burnout too. I don't know. Like, is there a difference between a burnout and a rock bottom? Now, now you've got me thinking here now that I'm, I'm like thinking this through out loud here as we're talking. So when you say rock bottom, I tend to think of that as burnout because you're so low and you, you don't have any, any resources and you, you, you feel a lack of hope and, um, just isolation. So that's how I'm imagining, um, yeah. hitting, hitting rock burnout. And, you just don't have anything else. <laughs> right. Don't ask me for anything. I don't have it. Um, and I forgot the question. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. No, I was curious as to, you know, one, and thank you for explaining that. And I think there are, there's probably different levels of rock bottom and, and different levels of burnout, right? right? You have like my rock bottom was from, from drug abuse. So that's very different from burnout. Right. Um, but let's just, let's just deal with like a burnout thing. And, mm -hmm. and I was just curious, you answered my question about shifting your perspective, but I was curious, like, can you even, is there steps that you would need to take in dealing with a burnout before you're even able to shift your perspective? That's well, what I'm kind of curious about. Cause I really haven't experienced like a burnout, like right. per se, you know what I mean? Right. So prior to shifting your perspective, you have to be aware that there is a problem, right? Um, and the point. <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's Prochesky and De Clemente uh, that talks about the uh, theoretical uh, model of change and it mostly used with substance abuse, but it starts with pre-contemplation. Contemplation, is this familiar at all? Mm -hmm. Yes. Pre okay, and, and most people are in that, um, that pre-contemplation or that contemplation stage where you're just like, either there's no, there's nothing wrong. This is just what you do. This is what family does. This is what a good employee does to that contemplation where you're like, am I the problem? You know, could it, so you've got to even be aware that there is an issue so that you can then begin to assess like where, where's the problematic behavior, what's going on. And once you then be, uh, are able to pinpoint, okay, these are problematic. Then you can dive into each of those. Okay, this problematic situation, what's the dysfunction there? What's functional and what's dysfunctional? What parts do I want to keep? Almost like when you go through your closet, <laughs> like I like to do every season. What can I fit? What can I fit? Let's get rid of that because you don't look cute in that anymore. Yeah. Well, you, you brought up such an important thing because so often people don't change because they don't feel like there is a problem. They don't feel like there is a need to change. Yeah. So 
if there are there any like telltale signs that somebody can look at themselves like like for me obviously mm -hmm. if if my if my friends are coming to me and be like you know you don't seem like you're the same person anymore what's going on or your your partner in life is saying what's going on then that th then there could be something going on with you but what about that person who just is like, no, everything's perfect and they don't see it. Like, is there any telltale signs that somebody can look at their life and say, oh, that that could be a red flag? Okay. And and that's an excellent question because I was going to say, usually how people discover it is that it's from other people telling them, hey, this is problematic. But if, if you're just an individual who's kind of solely focused on yourself and you, you you don't have a lot of relationships, if you begin to see, especially in the work capacity, if people are avoiding you, you notice that no one wants to partner with you in different projects, mm. if people are very short or they will only uh, speak to you through email, through written communication, because you've been, because uh, when you're in burnout, you tend to be more irritable and more volatile. So people will want to engage with you less. So they'll want to document it. So that's that's a really good clue. Um, <laughs> as well as physical ailments, headaches, stomach aches, racing heart, increased risk of heart disease, increased risk of, of diabetes too, uh, infertility, um, prolonged infections, uh, difficulty recovering. And for 35% of the people, it's even a risk of death. So oh, wow. there are a lot of physical ailments uh, that come with burnout. Yeah, because your your physical body is reacting to what's going on in your mind. Yes. For sure, for sure. That's huge. Yeah, I think that's probably, yeah, that's that's incredible. And I'm just, it's so funny when I talk to guests on on. on on my podcast, I, I start, I, I need to just like wait until I'm done. And then I can like think about it because it, because your mind starts going, I'm like, oh, my son's having that issue. Oh, so-and-so is having that. You know what I mean? You start mm -hmm. thinking about other people. Um, but that's such great advice because, you know, if, if somebody like for me, I'm not prone to headaches. If I start getting headaches, there's something wrong. Right. There's probably yeah. something wrong with me because I don't normally get headaches. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. you know another another thing that's that's really interesting about the whole process is that the recovery time. People often think, "Oh, well, I'll, I'm just going to go on a vacation, and I'm going to feel so much better, and that's going to cure it." No, it's not, because this has been a long term issue. It takes most people three to five years to recover. So I am still in recovery um, from burnout. And I still need to, because even though I'm shifting my perspective, those old habits, right? We tend to revert to that thing we know. And I have to catch myself sometimes and say, ah, oh, you're doing it again. Like I like to overload myself. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to, to be very mindful. And sometimes, like I said, it's the, oh my goodness, where are my glasses? They're on your head, mom. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, and you got me just thinking about just the, the last thing I want to talk about with the burnout is preventing burnout. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about that because while I've never that I know of experienced a burnout, I think it's because I'm, I'm a little, a little um, OCD about taking care of myself when yes. it comes to sleep. Like I need sleep. And I've noticed this over the past week. I've had, I've had a lot going on. I've been making myself lay down every day, even if it's like for 30 minutes, just to take like a power nap because it's, it's what, and then even over the, this weekend, I took a two hour nap, which I haven't done in months, but I, I took a two hour nap and it's mm -hmm. like, it's that recovery, you know, like, so I feel like I've just been so much going on and they're all really good things, but sometimes you can have a lot of good things going on in your life and you still can end up into a burnout phase. Yes. Yes. Especially so what pre-burnout, pre-burnout things, you know, so you don't get down that road. You don't go there. So, it, I mean, you're absolutely right. Being very, and dare I say religious with 
caring for your needs because we wouldn't treat our cars the way that we treat ourselves. Right. <laughs> so right. doing that preventive maintenance, I can't tell you how many people won't even go to the doctor or they, they just think, ah, it's okay. Like the old TVs, I'll just hit it on the side and it, it'll be okay. No, that didn't fix it. Go to the dog or doctor. Um, so taking care of your physical health, your mental health when you need it, support, whether it's support groups, whether it's a check-in with a therapist or, or family and friends that you're good to, being very mindful of the people in your circle, that's a real pre uh, preventative measure. So if you find that there are energy vampires around you or either you know begin to distance yourself some or decide, is this something that I need to eliminate? So yeah. the more that you can do to create we create, can't create a perfect environment, but we can create an environment that's as soothing as possible, where at least we have some respite, where if not all the time, we have a, um, a location to recover. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, and nowadays, since we still are very much, they may not be calling it a pandemic, but we're still, COVID's here to stay. I don't think it's going anywhere. Right. But I think nowadays, people are a lot more respectful when you when you postpone an engagement or getting together with people or you have to reschedule, I think, you know, people are more willing to do that these days because of the, the new world that we're living in. Um, right. So yeah, no, I love that. So what are some of the things that you're doing and, and some of the things that you can offer to somebody out there that is going through burnout? Oh, yes. I'm, I'm glad you asked. We have a new group mastermind that has just started to help nice. women begin with boundaries and, and uh, communication. So that's often a, a great way to, to prevent burnout, to have those in place, as, as well as we often do uh, complimentary webinars to help uh, people stop having regrets about their life and begin to create plans. So you can find all of those in my, uh, at my website or my link tree. Fantastic. And what is your website? It is drkimberlywilson.com. Easy peasy. <laughs> Easy peasy. <laughs> is there anything else that you'd like to share with the audience before we wrap it up? Um, just that mental health is health and that you are a valuable person and you don't need to put yourself out there in a way that is harmful to help someone else. Mm, I love that. Dr. Kimberly, Dr. Burnout, thank you so much for joining me and just continue doing what you're doing. It's such important work, such important work. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.